VMware ESXi bit by a snake. Hey, George. So what's the story you have for us today? All right. So I think this is going to be an interesting one. Um, so it's it's related to to virtual machines um, and the ESXi VMware model, um, which many corporations and you know many companies are using. It's the quickest one of the quickest ways, right, to 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 bring up like a uh, a bunch of VMs um, if you have one one server, right? You load this the ESXi operating system on there, and you can spin up a whole series of virtual machines. Um, and in this case. Um, and, and, you know, not necessarily by a vulnerability as much as by an opportunistic, uh, group managed to get shell access on a VS, on a, um, on an ESXi machine and encrypt all of the virtual drives that were on that box, mainly because they got shell access to the actual ESXi OS, which now gives them, um, pretty good access to the rest of the VMs that are on that box. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, it always leads to how did they get in? And it's always that one thing that, that companies probably should never do or, oh, it's like an old shucks moment, right? Um, so in this case, um, so in this case, there was a, a machine, right? And, and the story doesn't get too much into detail on how they acquired or how they got to that first step, but there was a box on the network that was running uh, on the same network as this ESXi server, right? So there was a machine, a workstation that was running, that was online and had TeamViewer running. Um, but it wasn't just running, TeamViewer was waiting for a connection. So you can load TeamViewer as an, as an agent, as a client, right? And look, try to remote into another machine, or you can keep it running on your machine, right? And then access to your machine from another machine with Team Viewer. So if you know your machine, so if you know you want to access your machine remotely at some point, you would just leave Team Runner service running, um, and you would go to your other machine, and you'd be able to access it remotely. So in this case, the bad actor um, knew that this specific workstation had Team Viewer running, and they they were able to kind of get access to that machine. And, and then I, I tried to find a few different versions of the article to see if we can get the step to where they actually, how they managed to get into this box. But they pretty much just said, and I'm going to try to use the term that they use. Um, uh, I, can't, I can't find it. Now. I think it was they just broke in to this specific TeamViewer account. So... When you break into a team viewer account, it's hard to say how they broke in. Maybe they brute forced it. Maybe they had credentials from somewhere. But the team viewer account that they were able to break into had domain access, domain administrator's access. Um, so once they were able to access that box, um, they pretty much had domain level administrator access. Um, and you know, it, it's probably the worst part of this whole thing, just the fact that TeamViewer was up and running um, and the person's, the person's machine that had it up and running had such a high-level control, right, of the network is, is also a terrible thing. Um, but, um, you know, once they were able to get to that machine, then they, they kind of laterally moved around. Um, they ran a, a scanner tool called the Advanced IP Scanner Tool, right, on the network. So they enumerated the network at that point, um, and they were able to find, you know, all the devices of interest. Um, they found the specific ESXi uh, machine because the user had domain access privilege. They were able to log into this machine, um, and they set up a. Um, so they 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 set up they installed this this remote access tool that a lot of IT companies use apparently, which I had never heard of until the specific attack happened. Um, it's called Bitvice. And Bitvice, it creates like a remote connection. Um, 
and it's a it's a it's a management tool like a workstation slash server management tool um and it's also it also allows for ssh connections so they installed this ssh client um and onto the actual vmware esxi server which the advanced ip scanner tool found so they found this esxi server and they said okay let's try to get on this box and let's try to ssh to this box um as soon as they got onto the box they they downloaded this bitvice tool right and were able to drop to a it's very specific uh esxi shell um it's very it's kind of it's it's I mean, I guess it's a typical Linux shell, but it's 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 proprietary to ESXi VMware's software. Um, and from there, they just literally ran a quick Python script to um, to kind of enumerate that server. And and this is where they were given all of the VMs that were installed on that ESXi server. Um, and at that point, we're able to drop. Uh, the ransomware or encrypt all the volumes that were on that server. Um, and, you know, that pretty much just started grabbing VM after VM and encrypting each one at a time. Um, and, you know, before you know it, they've had the entire VS ESXi server and all the VMs associated with it in their hands and encrypted, um, you know, and we're ready to, you know, sell it off, uh, essentially get paid by the company to unencrypt it. Um, so just another terrible story on ransomware. This one's a little more interesting because it's a little more specific to the SXI model uh, rather than just getting on a Windows box, right, and launching some, some, you know, some pre-created commodity ransomware that they can find anywhere. Um, this is very specific. They knew it was a Linux machine, right? There is Linux malware. We all know that. It's not extremely popular or as popular as Windows malware. But in this case, all they needed was shell access and a Python script. Um, and again, we can go back to the whole Team Viewer thing as being, you know, um, the gateway in. Uh, I'm, I'm sure at, at some point there must have been some kind of credential compromise to get to that point. I'm just not exactly sure that I found that in a few of the polls. I'm not sure if maybe the investigation is not complete, so they don't want to release all the info. But, you know, if if that's something that you picked up, I would love to hear it. I haven't really found, hasn't really gone that far back. But I just found it interesting that um, in all the ransomware conversations that, and all the stories we hear where it's always somebody clicked on a link, right, and then all these Windows machines get popped, here we have a VMware server running core Linux on the box, getting popped by a Linux, by a Python script. Um, and it wasn't just something, it was a pretty calculated, you know, group of steps that I feel like a lot of these things could be avoided, right? It's, it's some kind of layered security in place, um, which apparently in this case wasn't extremely in place. But I'd love to hear any, uh, you know, what you think about this and any things you would have done possibly uh, to kind of prevent this from happening at, at each step. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. And we'll see a well, lot more of it, I, I feel like. I think it's, it's quite interesting. This is not just, so this is not just like, uh, you know, Python ransomware targeting ESXi server or something like that. This is not what the story is about. I mean, that's a part of it. Um, but it seems like what the situation is, is there was some sort of an intrusion somewhere. And it started, it seems, with a, a compromise of a machine that had, I guess, some sort of a team viewer running, and somebody was able to somehow get the credentials. Maybe it was brute forcing. Maybe it was an easy-to-guess password. Who knows what it was, right? So I find that that part is, is very interesting because we don't hear that a lot. We hear about, like, RZP brute forcing. We hear about SSH brute forcing. We haven't heard much about brute forcing of this commodity, like, remote management software. So I think that's like the number, like one of the first things for me uh, that I take away. Um, right right away, what I'm thinking is, well, how come 
you know, two-factor authentication isn't being used in this instance. Mm -hmm. You know, the account, it seems like, you know, from your description, the account that they logged into had pretty privileged access. So by having mm -hmm. just one password to this, you know, machine controlled by TeamViewer, they were able to get on a very powerful account that had access to, it seems like, this entire organization. And it seems to me, again, that whoever was doing this, they had almost like a script, like a little, like here's the five things we're gonna do when we hack in. You know, the difference between somebody who is uh, doing like, um, you know, pen testing professionally and somebody who is a hobbyist is that when a hobbyist gets on your computer, they start looking around because they're not really sure what they wanna do. They didn't even think it was gonna work. You know, they uh, yeah. they were just rooting around. They found you and they got in. They they might even be surprised. So they never yeah. thought about what's next, and it shows in in what they do. But here, it seemed like whoever was behind this was really determined to do whatever it is that they were doing. They were ready to go. They you know they had the script ready. What it sounded like maybe in just a few hours from when they made the penetration. Um, so it's very, you know, well, you know, again, well organized. It seems group um, of individuals, or maybe one person um, who's behind this. And uh, it is interesting that they're targeting this ESXi, or that they had a, a script just for this ESXi shell. Um, it it really seems like they were, again, their motive here was to make this organization suffer, and they knew what they were going after and they knew how to inflict probably maximum damage because I think in a lot of environments, machines that are responsible for um, ESX or, or management um, you know, like this, you know, they're probably hosting a lot of different other virtual machines that are probably critical. Um, yeah. So, again, this is a, an interesting tactic in, in this adversary's toolkit um, of how to inflict maximum damage to make sure that the ransomware is paid. Overall, though, I think it's the same scheme that we've been hearing now for probably over a year. You know, you gain some sort of initial access somehow to an organization. In this case, it's a little bit different than usual. Um, it's through brute forcing TeamViewer. Uh, you know, another time it could be through a vulnerability in some sort of VPN client or something like that. Okay, so they did that. The next thing is they want to find out what you have in your network. Uh, again, I think that's pretty standard for some of these adversaries. You know, they want to, they do know, want to know where they wound up so they can select the the system that does the most damage. And in this case, they were ready to go. They were ready to go with targeting a very, I would assume this was the most important target they, they probably understood in this network because it probably, you know, I suspect hosted a lot of, I, I imagine, critical infrastructure. Um, so I think for everyone who's watching this, you know, who's wondering, like, how can I become a victim of ransomware and what can happen to me, it's really understanding what your exposure is. It's really understanding right. what do you have out there. Is it is it your VPN, um, you know, uh, appliance? Is that what you have out there? That's how people log in? How did they log in? Did they use a password? We know that, you know, somebody was just sharing with me uh, the top trend security trends from uh like maybe 10 to 15 years ago and you know what they shared with me is uh passwords were a problem 20 years ago and the most common password 20 years ago you know what it's the same password today it's like yeah. um, in, in essence you know human nature hasn't changed during this time so i think a lot of organizations um who have infrastructure out there should really think about how do we protect against this very easy tactic of, of brute forcing? How do we ensure that people can't just log in um, to our network um, and then access it uh, basically freely, right? They, they can't just move around easily. We're just talking about it in a different story about network segmentation. Yeah. Here's an example of a network that wasn't well segmented at all. You know, this one box, again, with remote access controlled by some kind of a password, had access to the entire network. You can go and, and do anything there. That's not very good segmentation uh, of your network. You know, you should have your critical appliances further removed and, and require several hops 
um, between that and a machine that's just exposed to the internet. Um, it shouldn't be that easy um, as you're just designing your infrastructure. Um, so that's another important key takeaway, I think, for everyone um, in this scenario. And of course, you know, the, the Python script is interesting. Um, I'm sure that just by reading this Python script that was used for this, um, um, uh, for the ransomware, we could probably pick up a few hints about who the adversary might be. You know, do they like to use single quotes or double quotes? Do they like to use spaces between their variable names? Do they like to use tabs in Python or spaces in Python? Even the name of the Python script could be interesting and could be used to tie together to, to the yeah. adversary uh, who's behind it. Um, that's all interesting, but I think for most people, um, you know, they should really be thinking, what's my exposure? Um, and then how do I protect against that exposure that I have externally? How, if someone was to attack me and install ransomware in my network, how would they go about doing it? Um, and then maybe go through that exercise yourself, like mentally, you just write down what you have and then think about how to protect it. I think that's the most important lesson out of this entire story. Cool. Thank you, Stan. Yeah, I, I was going to leave it with something similar where uh, simple configuration checks, right? Like apparently the ESXi server had an active shell that was running all the time that didn't need to be, and it's typically used for maintenance. Maybe just have change schedule and then that's when you open up the shell and then you bring the shell down or you, you do not leave it open to everybody so that they can just remote in the SSH um, and configure MFA for any machine that's exposed like you said if you find the exposure level to be at the internet level and it needs to be at least MFA right at least multi-factor um, which in this case it was not so great great observation and, and a really good tip 